last couple of times that I've been here, there's a theme, and that is a theme that is happening at Unity of New York, where I'm a, one of the associate ministers there. And it's a theme that is happening at Hope Community Church in Amherst, and I'm one of the ministers there. So there are three spiritual centers that I'm involved in on a regular basis. Uh, for the year 2018, this year, thank God, I will be here on twice a month. I will be here on the second and the fourth Sundays. Yes. Uh, last year, I was in Manhattan two Sundays, and I'm glad that I switched it. So this year, I will be in Manhattan on the first Sunday of each month, here on the second and fourth and at Hope Church in Amherst on the third Sunday of every month. And uh, there is a, the same theme is occurring in each of these spiritual organizations right now. It's a theme that is brought up, it needs to be brought up in many churches. I've been working in churches since I was a teenager and I'm 66, so at least 50 years I've noticed this reoccurring theme. And it's a reoccurring theme of, um, addressing the people and wanting the congregation to know that we as the leadership team or as the ministry body, we want so much to give you something of value. We want to give you something that is heavenly treasure, something that will allow you to transform your mind so that your entire life will be transformed. And we would love to be able to offer that to people and not ever say to anyone, our offerings are low. We cannot afford to pay the staff or pay the rent or pay for any kind of growth to happen. But in churches, that's not a possible for you never to have to mention it. Because many times in the world, we bring our money to get what we desire, and they have a price tag on it so we know what to bring. Mm -hmm. And what we do with our money is an announcement to the universe of what we value. Mm -hmm. wow. No one that I know, no one that I know, expects to get a brand new Lexus for $3,000 because it's valued at more than that. The people that I do know who have a Lexus and I say, how much did you pay for this? And they tell me a price that I would never consider paying for an automobile. I stand there knowing the only difference between me and them regarding this automobile is that they value it more than I do. I have a neighbor that has two big boats. He has spent a lot of money purchasing those boats, a lot of money maintaining those boats, and he loves those boats. It's no problem for him to put his money into them because he values having a boat and getting out on the lake or the river whenever he wants to in his own rig. I would never buy a boat. Not if they charged me $50 for a $2,000 boat. Why? I don't value boats. My values and what I announce to the universe I value has changed over the years, thank God. I used to value partying. All through my teenage years and all through my 20s, I valued partying. And if my mother said, what do you do with all of your money that you're asking me to help you pay your phone bill? With as much money as you're making, what are you doing with it that you can't pay your own phone bill? And if I was honest with mom, which occasionally I was, I would say, Mom, I've been partying my money away. Mom, I go to three different bars and two different clubs on a weekly basis. How much do you spend a week? Mom, don't scream. I average about $200 a week just socializing. Boy, that's a waste of your money. In her mind, it was a waste, because she doesn't value that. At the time, I did. I switched that at some point and got addicted to buying gold and diamonds for me, my siblings, my mom, and my children. My children lived in a rough neighborhood after the divorce. They moved back to Minnesota, where I had met 
my uh, ex-wife, and they lived in a rough neighborhood. And I was addicted to sending them gold and diamonds, which the bullies in the neighborhood beat them up and took from them a half dozen times, which I replaced each time until after about six or seven times, my son and my daughter each got on a phone line and they said, please don't send us any more gold or any more diamonds because dad, whether you know it or not, you are putting our lives in jeopardy. I valued giving them something that was not of any value to them. I have gotten into buying dishes. This is still one of my things. <laughs> I no longer buy drugs and alcohol and spend time in bars. I traded that in for diamonds and stuff when my kids were little. I got addicted several years ago to home improvement. <laughs> and I will say addicted. I was addicted. It wasn't just improving my home. Mm -hmm. I dreamed about getting to Home Depot. I dreamed about buying wood and buying pavers. At first I was on the inside of the house addicted to enhancing it, and then I went outside and Timothy never knew when I was going to say in the morning, you got to go with me to Home Depot. I'm going outside. I'm going to build two terraces outside. I'm going to put stonework all over. I'm going to dig out that hill and put stones all down there. A patio up there and one down here. And I'm going to have a deck built. I was addicted. You know why? I valued. I valued every brick I bought. I valued every paver I got. It gave me the same tingles as when I used to be to announce to the universe that gold and, and diamonds were what I valued. And as when I used to announce that partying, socializing is what I valued. Churches, I know that people value church. I know. That. <coughs> but there's no charge of admission to get in. When Sister Jennifer said, this is an amazing play I saw last night, you should check it out. And it's only $25 a ticket. It made me wonder how many people who go to plays, and I know Jennifer's not one of them, so I'm safe in saying this, but I have seen, known, and witnessed so many people in regards to churches, especially in Manhattan. I watch them. I watch people who are prospering in their lives. I mean, it's clear. It's clear that they value those shoes they've got and that Louis Vuitton handbag and they're just everything is just so and I watch them put ten dollars into the offering and then I listen to them discuss where they're going to have brunch mm -hmm. and cocktails after church mm -hmm. and I cannot help but say to myself isn't it interesting we pay willingly for physical food in nice restaurants and for the food of the spirit that we receive in churches and spiritual <coughs> organizations many of us drop in a five or a ten mm. so that we can save that thirty for a steak and two cocktails after church no one is comfortable no minister that I know no staff no board presidents are comfortable saying to the people can you please let us know that you value us, that you value this ministry by doing what you can. We're not asking you to go overboard. We're asking you just to look in your heart and see, are you announcing to the universe that you value this ministry? Yeah. And so that has come up the last two times I was here. And um, I believe it was in the year 2000, a process was given to me. I want you to know that every process I give to you is one that Spirit has given to me. So I'm in it with you. If Spirit gives me this process to look at what I value, that's me that has to do the <coughs> it. It's only when I've looked at it, when I've absorbed it, and when I've worked it, and I've seen the result of working it, that I as a minister am willing to pass it on to someone else. I won't ever advise you to do anything I haven't done. Never. 
I won't ever encourage you to go someplace I have not been willing to go. So in the year 2000, I was questioning the spirit. Spirit, I said, I tithe my 10% of my income faithfully. I think I do the right thing by helping others who have less than me faithfully. Why do I still feel stuck? Why are not the windows of heaven opening up and pouring me out a blessing that is beyond any I've yet to receive? I got clarity in one moment. During that period of my life, I had a son. I still have a son. <laughs> that period of my life, for about two or three years, I had a son who did nothing but ask me for money. And at some point, rather than just having the courage to say, if he said, Dad, do you have $500 I could get? Instead of just saying, I have $500 and I'm not giving it to you. What I said was, I don't have $500 that I can afford to give you. I need to have some work done on my car. I'm going to be needing to put a roof on my house. I always gave him the story of why I wasn't giving him the money, because I had given him the money every time he opened his mouth for years, and I was tired of it. I didn't simply say, Carlos Derrick, I have quite a bit of money, and I'm not giving you any more of it. You're 30. I went, each time, I went, I gave him an excuse, a reason. I tried to let him believe that if I had it, I would give it to him. But my life has so much stuff that I need it for. So when I got my big awakening, it was like, Carlos Wayne, if you don't think that shuts up the windows of heaven, then you're mistaken. You're announcing to your son, you don't have $500, when the truth is you do. And so I went, wow, are there other areas where I'm doing something wrong, where I'm working against the law? And this is what came to me, and I'm going to offer it to you all. And I'll, if I could get somebody to help me hand out things. I had been, every time I brought handouts for the last few weeks, I've been bringing 40 and taking some home. So this week I did 30, and we may have more than 30, and one or two of you may need to look off of someone else's sheet. And I would ask you to do what you did last time, which is not look at your sheet until everyone has one in their hand. First row doesn't have any. Jennifer, do you have any more? Yeah, can you bring some? Lots, more. Two more? Uh, we have three people on the front yeah, row who don't, don't have one. Oh, we need some in this row, too. Another here? Oh, you need one over there? Yeah. Oh, she had all more. Okay. I love this. I'm going to do 40 next time I bring it. <laughs> <laughs> or 50. <laughs> I got that from Raleigh. <laughs> the preparing for a full crowd. Yes. There was a Sunday, I don't know, a couple months ago, where when I came in, it was the band, Jennifer, myself, and I had seen one other person there. And I had, I think, gotten lost coming here, gotten off the wrong ramp or something. So it was about five minutes after 11, and I think it was Jennifer, me, Bob, the band, and one other person in the kitchen. And Raleigh was busy putting more and more chairs into this space. <laughs> and I looked at Raleigh putting these chairs, putting up more there and more back there, and I went, that man has more faith in people coming today than I do. <laughs> because what I, over, what I just said to God over there was, well, God, if it's just the seven of us, we're going to praise today. 
Raleigh went, there's going to be more of us. And guess what? All those seats got filled. In fact, two or three more had to get brought in from that side. Raleigh, you ministered to me that day. Glad expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. And that's what this man <coughs> demonstrated for me that day. So that's what I'll keep demonstrating whenever I go to my printer and hit print. I want... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do at least 40 each time. And if I take home leftovers, we'll be dank. But I'll prepare the space for 40 of God's children to show up. When I asked God that question, I got the revelation about how I was lying to my son. And not just lying to my son, but I was lying to the universe. I was convincing the universe by because my word is law, because I create my experience by the activity of not only of my thinking, but of my believing, of my feeling, and of my speaking. Mm. That every time I spoke the words to my son, oh, I'd love to help you, but I just don't have the cash. I announced to the universe, mm -hmm. I don't have the cash. <coughs> the universe never says, is he lying? <laughs> the universe just says, he's the son of God. His word is law. That's right. He just said, he doesn't have the money. No, have we the must money. accommodate him. He is the Son of God. His word is law. He just spoke limitation. We must accommodate him. And I began to look at all of the things, all of the ways I spoke. How I, I used to, I got in that period, it just got beyond my son. I started advertising my poverty. Anybody I ran into that I hadn't seen in a while. Hey Carlos, how's it going? Oh, good, man, if I could just get this money thing together. The universe. Listen to the Son of God. He is announcing he doesn't have his money thing together. We must accommodate him. If he says he has no money, when he actually has $4,000 in his bedroom, we must figure out a way to make that disappear. His word is law. He announced he doesn't have it. We'll have the furnace break down. We'll have the car break down. We'll have a hole come into the roof that he's going to have to need to patch. We will have this happen and that happen. And suddenly, a week and a half after saying I don't have any money, I didn't have any money. And the universe went, his word is law. He made an announcement. We have accommodated all is well with this world. <clears throat> These seven things came through me as quickly as I could keep up with my ink pen. We are going to read them together. I don't have my glasses on me. They're, they're my... Uh... Would you like to? <clears throat> you don't need them? <clears throat> you don't need them? No. I, 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 I have, have some, right? longer arms. Okay. <laughs> And we're going to actually stand up to read these. And we will read together. We will, including the title that the universe spoke to me. This is the universe speaking to me and today to you. Together? Seven ways to completely confuse the universe about your desire for greater prosperity. Number one. Pray to God for greater prosperity while maintaining a habit of sharing with yourself and others your convincing confessions of lack, limitation, financial frustrations, money fears, desperations, and unmet needs. That thought for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'll just glance at it. See, it does, are you anywhere in there? Mm -hmm. Are you like me? Do you do you find yourself Sometimes. sharing again and again and again mm -hmm. your confessions of lack and limitation for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. Number two. Pray, Pray to God for greater prosperity, prosperity while refusing to extend the tenth of what you already received as income. income. Pause and think. Are you anywhere in there? There's no shame, no blame. We're just finding out where we're at. We're not bad. Number three. 
Pray to God for greater prosperity without working for it. Work is efforting spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically toward the goal of accomplishment. Awesome, take that in. Number four. Pray to God for greater prosperity while simultaneously working to convince the IRS, bill collectors, individual people you know or we know of, or any other agents or agencies, that you are less prosperous than you actually are in fact. I have done that with all of the people and organizations <laughs> named here. I have tried to convince the IRS that I had money, less money than I actually had, or made less money than I actually did. Not just my son, but my mom, my dad, my ex-wife, my friends, anybody who would dare care to listen to my story of woe around why I'm not already rich when I just knew I sure would be by the time I turned 21. <laughs> Number five. Pray to God for greater prosperity by blaming them or it for not having enough and more already. Faulting parents, spouses, children, exes, bosses, the state of the economy, isms, policies, government agencies, culture, race, religion, early childhood conditions, the alignment of plants, abusers, con artists, curses, exes, karma, or the will of God. I was all over that one. I was all over that one. <laughs> Amen. State of the economy, that's why. No. Government agencies, that's why. Mm. Maybe if I hadn't been abused when I was a kid, I would just be more responsible mm. as an adult. I was all over that Amen. one. Don't and there were plenty of times where I, somebody who actually knows in my heart that such things don't exist for me, would find myself saying, I wonder if somebody put a curse on me. I don't even believe in curses. But it was a good thing to contemplate. <laughs> Our next one. Pray, Pray to God for greater prosperity while not being a personal action commitment to share a portion of what you already have with those who have less. Choosing instead to waste your rule of thumb expenditures that you are very clear have nothing at all to do with the right use of funds. And I've already made my confession about that one. <laughs> Number seven. Pray to God for greater prosperity with your mouth while waiting on you to realize that your thoughts, feelings, intentions, actions, reactions, motivations, and conversations, expectations, suspicions, worrying, negative intentions, doubting, and every other mental focus and intention are prayers also and would require a greater power to manifest into form and experience than do any repetitions or emotional, fearful, pleading, and begging supplications. More powerful also, even than beautifully constructed words of affirmation uttered before beautifully constructed altars on which candles can only satisfy shining and where incense the candles can safely burn with sense most heavenly. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. Eighteen years ago, I asked the universe a question. What am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. How can I improve? How can I open the windows of heaven wider? There were a couple of things on here that I was doing. I have always, always tithed a tenth of my, a, at least a tenth of my income to spiritual organizations that feed my spirit. And I have always identified people who have less than me who I, lo I love giving. 
I love giving. Mm -hmm. And I've also confessed that I have announced to the universe that I value other things. Mm -hmm. I've also confessed to you that I've not told the truth to my son at times or to the IRS at others. I've also confessed to you that I have sent invoices as to why I wasn't prosperous to the government, to hiring agencies, to the way it is, to the fact that black men don't have an easy time getting in certain doors, whatever it is. I've done all of that. And I have so many times had a mind that is filled with catastrophizing mm -hmm. around lack and limitation. Yeah. And I went into my room where I have created a really beautiful altar. It has a statue, you can sit down. It has a statue of Jesus. It has a statue of Kuan Yin. It has a statue of Shiva. It has a beautiful head of a Buddha. It has incense. It has white candles and gold candles. It has green cloth over it because I was instructed early in my life that green is the color of prosperity. And so many times that I sat in front of that altar and I made affirmations. I am the holy child of God in whom God is well pleased. It is my Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. All that I touch prospers. And I would be there for 20 minutes in that meditation. And I would get up out of the meditation and leave my prayer room. And my mind would pick up where it had left off with worry, concern, and <coughs> doubt that I would ever, ever be solvent, <coughs> that I would ever actually have a savings account, mm. that I would ever be able to just take a breath and relax. <coughs> and so what was going on in my mind before and after going to my altar was more creative than me sitting there going, I am the holy child of God yes. in whom God is well pleased. Yes. It is my Father's good pleasure to yes. give me the kingdom. Everything I touch prospers. Which did I believe? Mm. I believed the thing that controlled my mind, not of its own doing, but because I let it. Yes. So if you are blessed in any way to clarify your own relationship with your own prosperity by my having offered what the universe offered to me, then I am so grateful. Yeah. And if you did not receive anything from it, I make no apologies because my intention is always to bless. Yeah. Thank you for listening. We have a hand go up. I probably know the answer in my heart, but I'd like to hear your words of um, how I can not beat myself up for when I read these things. You know, how the guilt and the shame, you know, com comes in on me. Do I have any words? I would just say, make it your commitment. I think that when we beat ourselves up, we are always like making something up. We make up that other people have it together, and I'm the one who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is screwing up, and I am screwing up. Mm -hmm. Other people freely give, and I'm stingy. And I've just said earlier, everybody is a mix. We, we, if you make that statement for yourself, probably every single one of us have felt that same feeling of beating ourselves up or, or feeling some shame or guilt just about how we operate in life. Um, I, really, I really want us to work to lay down shame and guilt. I truly believe that many of us entertain guilt and shame because we think that it will serve a worthy purpose. <laughs> if I become ashamed enough and feel guilty enough, I will change my behavior. And I don't think such things are possible. I think back in the 1950s when I was a kid, they really believed, many people really, really <coughs> believed they weren't trying to be mean. They were trying to do the right. They believed the more you beat a child, yes. mm -hmm. the more 
possibility for that child to be awesome. <laughs> to be good. To beat the, they used to say, I'm going to beat the devil out of you. Things that and and they, that, but they believed that, it. That they weren't that, trying so. to be mean. Yeah. They, did, they didn't see it as crazy. They pointed out a scripture that said, Spare the rod, you spoil the child. Not until I got into metaphysics and came into unity that I get that the correct interpretation of rod was not something to beat somebody with. The rod is the law. Like, give them the laws of the universe. Give them the law that what you plant, you will reap. Like, intentions and thoughts and behaviors as well. Give them the law. Spare not the law, and you will not spoil the child. And one of the laws is that we are equal in God's sight. Mm -hmm. And so, if, if you are feeling guilt or shame, at least know that God is not feeling any of that is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Hey, dude, the only thing God can think when God beholds you is this is my beloved son mm -hmm. in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. So, guilt, shame, they can't make us better. They can't make us do the right thing. Never can. Never will. Only love and embracing ourselves and going, wow, this is where I've been. This is where I am. And there is where it's possible for me to go. I hope that was helpful. In some and I just loved how a couple times ago when you told about your mother, you know, it just reminds you, I'm excited to look at this work. Yeah. I'm excited to look Absolutely. at Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a friend in Massachusetts, and he's a funeral director. And there are times when I run into him and I go, how's business? <laughs> Slow. <laughs> Nobody's dying lately. <laughs> going, his, his work depends upon there being people who die. I mean, that's... Well, he is. You know, doctors, they depend upon the fact that there are people who manifest illness so that they can accommodate it. My mom's work was ending racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, elitism. So when she saw how much of that stuff was in the world, she would go, I have so much work to do. That was her job. What if they all disappeared overnight? <laughs> <laughs> I preached a sermon once years ago in Massachusetts, and my sermon title was Put Me Out of Business. Right. My job as a minister, my, my job as a minister is to awaken the children of God from falling asleep and dreaming the dream of separation from the Creator and from one another. My job is to remind us when we forget of who we are and whose we are. Mm -hmm. To remind us of the law of sowing and reaping, that any energy we put out is going to get multiplied, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and returned right back to us. So I preached, put me out of business. Get to a point where you don't need me to remind you because you